soul starts to linger It's home, I know If you catch me daydreaming Now and forever Thoughts are carrying me alone To that place Urbanization of Southern Ontario challenges many communities in their efforts to maintain the characteristics that make them unique. In many cases, once autonomous towns and villages are being enveloped through urban infill, leaving one place quite indistinguishable from the next. Meeting this challenge by keeping its history in the forefront is the town of Aurora. I have here an article written for a local newspaper a few years ago entitled Aurora's Place in History or how to reply when someone says they've never heard of the place. We are given here a few facts to let us know what we really should have known all about in the first place. Well now, if we were going to describe Aurora, we would certainly mention that it is on one of Ontario's oldest roads, Young Street. We would have to say that it was in the middle of rebel country during the uprisings of 1837. It would be absolutely necessary to talk about Ontario's first railway line and the important speech that was made by Edward Blake here in 1874. The real clincher for Aurora is that it was the boyhood home of one of our most popular prime ministers. Tell you what, why don't we simply meet the author of this article and prepare ourselves for the inevitable question, have you ever heard of Aurora? Writing a report from York in 1793, John Graves Simcoe mentions, the soil between this place and Lake Simcoe is perfectly calculated for farming. And before the summer, the road of communication will probably be thickly settled. The inhabitants will soon raise an abundance of provisions and the rivers and bays abound with salmon. It is along Simcoe's road that Aurora has evolved for over two centuries from a stagecoach stop to a modern day community. Here's John McIntyre, teacher, historian, and author of our quoted newspaper article. Well, certainly the key to Aurora's early development and the development of this whole area was Young Street that was planned by Lieutenant Governor John Graves Simcoe to link Lake Ontario with the Upper Lakes. And it was an important transportation route, but also it was a route that settlers used to get into the hinterland. And an important military route as well for flying the, uh, the Upper Lakes area. And if it hadn't been for Young Street, the settlers would not have come into this area at all. So they were here in what is now known as Aurora by the, by the late 1790s. Uh, virtually all of the land on either side of Young Street within the present bounds of Aurora was taken up by about 1800 by farmers who had settled here. And who were these people who came to claim a stake in the future? Jacqueline Stewart is curator of the local museum. The very first settlers had, with one exception, American backgrounds. They had uh, served with the uh, British Army or had been loyal supporters of the British during the American War of Revolution. Uh, most of them went first to the Maritimes where they were granted land, found the land there not as uh, 
profitable as they had hoped and, and eventually came to Upper Canada and to this part of the world. Um, that was in the 1790s. Once settlement really got underway in the early years of the last century, probably most of the Aurora people had English, Scottish and Irish backgrounds. Very important to the early development of the community was the presence of streams here, the, the creeks which flowed through this area, which are actually branches of the, of the Holland River. And now in Aurora, we tend not to think very much about the, about the creeks, but they were very important because they powered some early mills that were located here, uh, an early flour mill, for example. And once a mill was established, then other industries tended to follow. The soap-making enterprises of McNally's Ashery, William Morton's Brewery, Campbell and Sons Rope Makers, and DeVille's Tannery are listed as some of the early commercial activities at the Crossroads Village. It wasn't called Aurora at that time. One of the earliest merchants to set up shop here was a man named Richard Machel, who set up his store at the corner of Young and Wellington Streets. And because of that, uh, the community came to be known as Machel's Corners. For the small population, the period of rebellion in Upper Canada, 1837, brought political tensions. Dick Illingworth, a former mayor, and sometimes called Mr. Aurora. Because of the, it was just west of here where they marched uh, down, and in fact, they gathered here in Aurora march down Young Street to, um, you know, take over the uh, printing presses and whatnot mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. William Lyon Mackenzie. Mm -hmm. In his drive to unseat the ruling family compact, Mackenzie found many local sympathizers. After his exile in the United States, it was his Aurora admirers that celebrated him at the old temperance hall. But it would be 20 years later that the grandest day in the town's history was recorded, May 16th, 1853. Boy, that must have been exciting. The crowds cheered as though it were a sporting event. The officials cleared the track, and the crew scooped water from the creeks back there to keep the boilers filled. Pulling three flat cars, decorated with evergreens for the festivities, huffing and puffing came the steam engine Toronto on the first rail line laid in Upper Canada. Machel's Corners was at the head of the line. And for this tiny settlement, the future was brighter than ever. Postmaster of the village, Charles Doan, realized that the coming of the railway would mean some pretty big changes for the community. It would mean a lot of growth, new settlers, uh, industries starting to come in. And he felt to symbolize that, the community needed a new name. Machel's Corners didn't sound very impressive. And the name he chose was Aurora which is the, the name of the uh, Greek goddess of the dawn. And Doan saw the coming of the railway as the beginning of a new age, or the dawn of a new age for the community, and, and indeed for the whole country. And so Aurora was chosen in 1854. <laughs> Aurora is on the northern slope of the glacial formation known as the Oak Ridges Moraine, part of the Lake Simcoe watershed. It was Simcoe himself who, recognized as the founder of the present city of Toronto, envisioned Upper Canada as a favored land bound to prove attractive to farmers. Ironic that the city's expansion over the last century has swallowed up much of the productive surrounding farmland. The future and its expectations were the talk of the town in Aurora in mid-1800. The steel rail was an avenue to expanded markets, and new business meant prosperity for the Young Street community. 
The coming of the railway did bring a number of, of new industries, particularly the Fleury Agricultural Works. Uh, Joseph Fleury was a blacksmith in King Township, and he saw the coming of the railway as a great opportunity for him to expand his business and his enterprise. So he moved his shop into Aurora. And from that blacksmith shop grew a factory which produced plows and many other kinds of agricultural implements that lasted until the late 1930s. At its heyday, um, we believe that Fleury's employed approximately 200 people. So that was a quite a large enterprise at, at that time. And by the 1880s, 1890s, uh, when the Canadian West was opening up, they shipped um, hundreds of, of plows, uh, probably thousands of, of plows yearly into the, the Canadian West. And they could do that so easily because Aurora was, was on the main line between Toronto and the, and the prairies. The closing of the 19th century saw a wave of activity which accompanied the addition of the electric street railway. Known as the Metropolitan Railroad, it linked the communities along Young Street as far north as Lake Simcoe. The old Aurora Public School was built then, a very grand building for what was still really a, a village, a small village. Um, there were merchants up and down both sides of Young Street. There were churches. There were umpteen organizations. Uh, there was industry. Uh, that was a, a prosperous time. Constructed in that heyday, many of today's heritage buildings make visible the town's history. Aurora was a relatively small community of um, two, perhaps 3,000 people in the 1880s when the public school was built and yet it was one of the finest schools in the province. Just the very size of that building and the detail that was lavished on it suggested how important it was as a symbol um, for the community. Great importance was placed on education. A young Lester Pearson was soon to acquire a nickname in his school days that would follow him through his political career. He was not born here, but moved here as a, as a young child his family came here when his father was appointed minister at the Methodist Church. And so it was here in Aurora that Lester Pearson started school in the building that's now the Aurora Museum. And I remember hearing a story about him. He was in kindergarten or, or first form at that time. And in one of the upper forms, they were learning Roman numerals. And the students in that upper form were having tremendous difficulty grasping the uh, essentials of, of Roman numerals. But young Lester Pearson evidently had been tutored at home, and he knew all his Roman numerals, even though he was just starting school here. So the teacher marched down to the first form room and brought up little Lester, and, and he went right through the, the Roman numerals from start to finish. And from that time on, I think he, he had a a difficult time in the schoolyard because my great aunt uh, has told me that uh, she remembers him being called Smarty Pants Pearson when he was here because of his proficiency and not only in Roman numerals but in so many other subjects in school. Recognized in education today is St. Andrew's College. Founded in 1899, it moved to Aurora from Toronto in 1926. A woman who became prominent in the early days of medicine was a widow with five children who was not to be held back from a new career. She was born in Aurora. She was born Josephine Irwin in the 1850s, grew up here. She married a young dentist named John Wells. I think perhaps began her dental studies under him, but then she did go to the uh, Royal College of Dentistry. She graduated, the first woman to graduate from any Canadian dental college in 1893. She traveled up to Aurora, 
on a regular basis to serve the Aurora community. Uh, like other dentists of the time, she promised in her advertisements in the local paper, painless dentistry and uh, beautiful false teeth and so on and so on. I suspect that the uh, turn of the century idea of painless dentistry would be a bit different from ours. <laughs>
the colorful Herb Lennox. He was a man who claimed to know everybody in the community. And there's one story that I, I remember hearing that at one of his famous picnics, he uh, walked up to a constituent whom he, he really didn't know, but he pretended to know him and said, oh, hello, Joe, how's your father? And Joe said to him, well, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, father passed away, father died last year. And uh, Herb Lennox said, oh, that's too bad. Your father was such a fine man, wonderful man, great loss to the community. And then, then walked away and shook some other hands and then came back to this fellow again later on, but forgot that he'd met him before and said to him again, oh, hello, Joe, how's your father? And, and Joe simply looked at him and replied, he's still dead, Herb. <laughs> But he was a gifted man, and uh, he had a strong local following and defeated Mackenzie King. Good old Herb. And finally, from Aurora's past, a message for today. Well, being in politics, you had some pretty important precedents yes. that took place here. Harvey, I guess one of the best known was the speech that uh, Edward Blake gave on the need for nationalism in Canada, for us to get together and think as a nation. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's gone down in history really as the Aurora speech and is still being quoted in political science classes. And you know, maybe today, somebody should give that same type of speech yeah. because we've got to start thinking as a nation again. Well, that speech was given in 1874 and it's a speech that could still be made today. The same thing. And then there was George Brown, who uh, also gave a speech in Aurora, <clears throat> just about the time or just after the rebellion, mm -hmm. uh, about rep by pop, the need to have... Representation Democrat, by Democrat. population. Yes. Yeah. So as I say, Aurora, you know, we get back to how the start of the program, nobody knows about Aurora, mm -hmm. and yet there are many, many incidents yeah. where Aurora really uh, is well known across the country yeah. for something that we've done or something that has happened. Yeah. Machel's Corners, William Lyon McKenzie, Blake, Flurry Implements, Lester Pearson. Now, how do you reply when you're asked the question, have you ever heard of? <laughs> you got it. I'm Harvey Kirk. We'll see you next week. It'll always be home. home.